Your Excellency and Mrs. De Jersey, our guest of honour, Lord Judge, uh, Lady Judge, judges and retired judges of all jurisdictions, our academic colleagues and members of the legal profession, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Banco Court. Our distinguished speaker tonight is, of course, Lord Judge, Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales from October 2008 until September 2013. I could go into great detail about his long and distinguished career, but you can rather assume it. What you might not assume is what one of his peers, Lord Dyson, who spoke in this court last year, said of him on his valedictory. He is an all-rounder who has bags of common sense and not one of those specialists whose feet are not always on the ground. This is the fifth Supreme Court oration. We are rapidly establishing a wonderful tradition of eminent and fine orators. This oration is a particularly momentous one concerning the Magna Carta 800 years since its story began. Lord Judge, who is the immediate past president of the Selden Society, is the co-author of a book, Magna Carta Uncovered, published last year. You may have seen it as you came in. One of the reviewers made this observation about it. Too idealistic an approach would lead to an over-romanticization of the common law tradition. Too skeptical an approach would fail to explain the esteem in which it is held and the fact that through the centuries it has formed a unique rallying call for the defense of liberties. It is the great strength of Magna Carta uncovered that it does neither. That may give some guide to Lord Judge's approach in setting the historical context for the Charter. We are very lucky to have Lord Judge to speak to us tonight, not only because of his great interest in and expertise on the topic. I learned today that he was born during the World War II siege of Malta with strikes on the maternity hospital as the Luftwaffe tried to bomb the island into submission, and that he has faced the bowling of Michael Holding. <laughs> so I would really call that lucky. Your Excellencies, Chief Justice. Yep, I think I'd prefer to be talking to you than facing Michael Holding. <laughs> it was Gerald Brennan who described Magna Carta as an incantation of the spirit of liberty. Among many, many descriptions that I've heard this year and read this year, this was one of the most apposite. Here in Australia, of course, you have your own copy and the physical evidence of the 1297 Charter. I hate to say it, but a poor school in England was conned out of its Magna Carta. You paid 12,500 English pounds for it. That's not a great deal of money. But anyway, you have it. Uh, but my thesis is that you had it long before you bought that particular copy. There was I'm not a, an apologist for British imperialism or colonial policy, but there was one interesting facet of British colonial policy which was quite unique among all the colonial powers, France, Spain, Netherlands, Portugal. English and Welsh and then Irish and Scottish people settled in the colonies. They didn't simply send a ruling class out to supervise and organize shiploads of wealth back to England or back to Britain. It was a principle of law that the colonists enjoyed the same rights in the colony as if they were English citizens. It was a unique principle. It's hard to believe it, but among all the misery, among all the inhumanity, among all the dreadful things that happened, in the ships that sailed towards Australia in the very late part of the 18th century, along with them came Magna Carta, 
wasn't printed on the ship's tally, it wasn't there on the mast, but it came. And along with the language which we all speak came the Charter of Justice of 1787 and Magna Carta. Sir Gerald Brennan obviously revered it, so speaking personally do I, but not to the extent that we should take it for granted. I've chosen the title to this lecture quite deliberately. By definition, history is only studied with the benefit of hindsight. It seeks to answer questions like, what happened? Why did what happened happen? I shall tell the story, or something of the story, and you can make up your own minds whether this was luck or judgment, accident or destiny, inevitable or fortuitous, or even as though some of us might arrogantly assume, the inevitable cause for those rousing tributes given by determination of Britons on the last night of the proms, and I suspect a determination shared by all of you, never, never, never to be slaves. But, whatever else they were, the people who gathered at Runnymede in 1215 were not British. British didn't exist. English hardly existed. The King and the Barons were at best Anglo-Norman, and the bigwigs in the City of London were largely Anglo-Saxon. They spoke different languages. They spoke different languages to each other, and certainly None of them spoke our language. Let's start at the beginning. In 1215, the charter was not a matter of great moment. This was a generation of charters. They were dished out on the char continent. Equivalent charters to this one were given out. I'm only picking you some examples. Hands up those of you who know about the Golden Bull of Hungary of 1222. Wonderful name. Anybody? No. Nope. The Golden Bull of Hungary of 1231. Anybody? No? What about the charter issued by the Holy Roman Emperor in 1220? No. Grants by the King of Aragon in 1283 and 1287? No. But they were all typical. They were dished out, charters were dished out by the score. We know about none of them except for Magna Carta which had an extraordinary long-term impact. And to confirm that we're looking at an age when charters were dished out like confetti, we have simply to remember that what we, what I am describing as Magna Carta, was in fact four charters. John sealed it, one in 1215. There was a 1216 charter and a 1217 charter both sealed by the regent, William Marshall, and that's a very important part of the story. And the 1225 charter, uh, which the king, young king, had just reached some level of maturity, and he could exercise some regal power in 1225. And very importantly, traded his seal on the fourth charter in this series for a grant of tax by the Council of the Realm. But that's four charters in a decade, not one in 800 years. That enables us to focus. And indeed, by contrast with the charters on the continent, Magna Carta was confirmed over 50 times by kings of England, running through till the, well into the 15th century. And at each confirmation, its new meaning became embedded because our language was developing very rapidly. And so each king issuing or confirming the charter, rather, confirming the charter, gave it its new meaning. As the continental charters withered and then decayed, Magna Carta emerged as the first and still to my mind the most important of all legal codes meriting this very important description the living instrument. In the hands of over-activist judges, that's a rather dangerous concept. In the hands of sensible, balanced judges, it gives the common law one of its great strengths, flexibility. 
Now, for convenience for tonight, I shall refer to Magna Carta as if it were a single document, save where the sense requires otherwise, and uh, with particular focus, of course, on the document of the 1215 edition. Well, you read in your books, we used to read in our books, how King John signed it. And when you were little boys and girls, you saw little pictures of him clenching his teeth and signing. Well, he never did. He put his seal on it. It was sealed on his behalf at Runnymede. Even the date is controversial. Leading scholars of history in the way leading scholars of history can have argued pages and pages and pages proving that he sealed it on the 15th. No, he didn't. He sealed it on the 19th. Well, I'm sorry to be a simple lawyer. It does say 15th June, so let's go along with 15th June. <laughs> and I'm sure you all had a classical education, at least all of the, those of you over 30, of whom there are one or two among my audience, uh, read your Latin when you were schoolboys and schoolgirls. I know you'd all be able to read the Latin of the original script, if it was fractionally more manageable, and you did, you would note the word parliament can't be seen, nor can the word democracy, nor can the words trial by jury. Indeed, perhaps most surprising of all, the two words Magna Carta don't even appear on the 1215 Magna Carta. What a strange document. But you see, for all that, there are other crucial words, constitutional words, political words, to be found in the 1215 Charter. They include liberties and customs and rights and justice and lawful judgment and even the law of the land which not long afterwards became due process, and the Common Council of the Realm, which very shortly afterwards came to be known as Parliament, and security, the crucial guarantee clause 61, which was, it sounds very grand, and I don't apologize for claiming this, which was the rule of law in gestation, in embryonic form. And the constant reissuing of the Charter demonstrates its gradual evolution and underlines that it was a living instrument. So as an example, or as examples, the title of the 1297 Charter, your Charter, Magna Carta de Libertatibus, you don't need to have had a Latin education to understand what that means, Magna Carta de Libertatibus Angliae. That formally linked Magna Carta with what we would now describe as fundamental freedoms. That is your charter. By 1331, whatever the controversy earlier, and however many times you will read about how this was all about the barons and nothing but the barons, I'll come back to clause 60, but just dealing with the evolving charter, the justice and safety provisions were attached to, and I'm quoting, every man in the land, whether therefore villain, serf, or merely a free man. And the words due process of law appeared for the first time 1354. Those are words of fundamental importance to our liberties. And so gradually, in social conditions and societies far removed from ours, it's difficult for us to begin to imagine what life was like in the 13th century. How can we? But gradually, Magna Carta and most importantly, what Magna Carta was understood to stand for became part of the fabric of our political thinking. And gradually, and over the centuries, it came to be exported to places which none of those assembled at Runnymede had ever heard of, like the future United States of America, or this extraordinary continent way over on the other side of the world, when most people believed that the world ended and we all dropped off the edge if we went too far. And its ideas of constitutional and legal freedoms came to be encapsulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, described by Eleanor Roosevelt, one of its architects, as a Magna Carta for the, mod for the modern world. All that's by way of introduction. It's portentous stuff, though, isn't it? But the crucial fact 
to be grasped is, is that Magna Carta was sealed at the outbreak of a civil war to prevent the horrors of civil war. There is no worse form of war. Its inevitable destiny, if you'd had a bet at the time, was the scrap heap, not worth the vellum that they'd worked to provide for it. Conceivably, it would have provided an opportunity for an extremely brilliant and utterly geekish young man or woman here in Australia to write a PhD and set off on a journey to an illustrious academic career. After all, how many of us have heard of the Charter of Liberties? Notice, it's there, the Charter of Liberties of Henry I. That's not a rhetorical question. If you have heard of it, raise your hand. Brilliant. Forgive me saying so, too. And how many of us, oh, I forgot to say, as you'd be unsurprised to know, it contained the usual aspirations to firm peace and the restoration of good old law. And the Oxford Charter of King Stephen, raise a hand, please. There's a good clause in that. It promises peace and justice, and the king will get rid of all unjust practices and will once again revert to the observations of the good ancient customs. Medieval monarchs all over the continent swore a coronation oath. They would be good kings. It was always kings. They would do law and justice. The coronation oath, of course, bear in mind, was made to God in heaven. And it was to God, not to his subjects, that the king thought, and everybody else thought, he was answerable. And so when a bad king died, he came before the judgment seat. He was examined by the court of heaven and decided whether he'd kept his promise. And if he hadn't, no doubt he was sentenced to hell fire and damnation. But however appalling that sentence for the monarch's immortal soul, it had absolutely no alleviating effect on the lives of his, suffering, of his suffering subjects he had left behind. In other words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the rule of law in heaven was not nearly as useful to human beings as the rule of law here on earth. And these were years of crisis. The anointed king against a group of rebel barons. The rights and wrongs don't really matter for today's purposes, though it can fairly be said not one of them was fighting for the democratic right of each subject to vote in an election. But there were people still alive who would have remembered the dreadful civil wars between Stephen and Matilda, that was King John's grandmother, the murder of Thomas of Becket, all recent, recent, in my case, as, say, Winston Churchill is, part of something that you grow up with. And perhaps the final ingredient of this contemporary world that we have to try and grasp, although we can't fully, as I said earlier, grasp it, is this is a time when life was short and cheap, and the immortal soul and the heavenly judgment which would follow was vividly in the minds of most people. They had a very deep religious conviction. And so Magna Carta did not emerge Hollywood-like, with a bright apparition, the sun starting to shine, violins playing ascending chords, Hollywood fashion, from a muddy, misty field at Runnymede near Windsor Castle. It was set, as all historic events are set, in its historic contents, context. And this is where religion and politics were completely enmeshed. Now let's just deal with it on a purely political front. England was placed under papal interdict by the Pope Innocent III just ten years before the Charter was sealed. That meant that most of the holy sacraments, which were of crucial importance to medieval people, were not available to them. In January 1209, that not having done the trick, the Pope excommunicated the king. And neither the interdict on the country nor the personal excommunication served to change John's conduct. So in 1213, Innocent III pronounced sentence of deposition on him. And, and I hate to use this phrase because it has so many dreadful connotations to us, even as I speak, and authorized the King of France to wage holy war on him. More bothered by the prospect of a holy war to depose him than by the 
potential consequences to his immortal soul of failing to abide by the papal instruction, John immediately submitted to the Pope in May 1213. We're now only two years away from the Charter. The political consequence of this submission is often overlooked. John accepted the Pope not only as his spiritual father, but as his feudal overlord. His kingdom was surrendered. John became the vassal of the Pope. So in addition to his spiritual authority over him, the Pope had unadulterated political authority over John's kingdom. In feudal law, John could not make any agreement which could bind his feudal lord without reference to that feudal lord. That has consequences to which I shall come. What about the Pope? Innocent III never knowingly undersold himself. He was generous enough to acknowledge. I like the modesty implicit in this. I'm lower in status to God. <laughs> Not bad for a pope. But greater than man, judge of all men, and judged by none. That's a recipe for a dictator, isn't it? Anyway, what in England we call Eurosceptics, Eurosceptics of the day would have read their garments. And when the Pope later directed them that they were obliged to pay the taxes required by the king irrespective of their consent, well, nowadays they would have donned sackcloth and ashes and gone on to discussions on the television, but in medieval times you took out your sword and your shield and your armour, and that's what they did. Because into this turbulent mix came a catastrophic defeat for King John's allies in France in the summer of 1214. Plantagenet kings spent their whole reigns thinking they were the kings of France. And they all wanted to get France back, even Henry VIII, syphilitic, overweight, sat on a horse in 1544 trying to win back France. Anyway, they were constant defeats, never put off. But when he did return to England from that particular escapade, he was broke, treasury empty, as well as utter military humiliation. And wars then, as now, involved huge expenditure. John had no money. He needed to replenish his funds. There was no quantitative easing. Oh, if only they'd invented that a few hundred years ago, but there was none. And instead, he wanted to raise taxes in the form of something called scootage. Now, those of you who are Latin scholars know exactly what the word scootage means, but my wife's here, and I don't know, and I always have to read this bit out. <coughs> scootage is shield money. It's a form of taxation. It works in a very simple way. Your feudal lord says to you, I'm going off on a campaign. I'm joining the king. We're going to conquer France and we'll get a lot of land for ourselves. Uh, you've got 10 acres. You better bring three blokes along with you, or two acres, or 15 acres, or whatever it was. You had to bring a number of men to fight with you. Scootage meant man carrying a shield. It became pretty obvious that if you took three yokels from, shall we say, uh, Malulabar, just for the sake of argument, and said, you're coming off to fight a war with me in France, uh, you'd be much better off saying, hang on, you stay there. You keep, if you've got a pitchfork, you're lucky. If you've got an axe, you're amazingly lucky. You're a very rich man in medieval times. Uh, look, let's just give it in money form then the king can actually employ soldiers who know how to fight. And that's scootage. It's a form of taxation. You pay the king to buy men-at-arms. Now, let's just reflect. If the king could get scootage off you whenever he wanted, it was a form of taxation. And so, to pay for wars outside the country, the tax of scootage was resisted. And this is how the toing and froing to a civil war began. They were not contemplating great political affairs. They were looking at the real world, looking at the money in their pockets, and so on. There was a big effort to negotiate a settlement. The first part of it happened in the temple in London. John issued a charter to the church in England in November 1214, another in January 1215. It was nothing to do with his immortal soul, ladies and gentlemen. The church was the most powerful body on, in, the, in his kingdom, and he wanted the church on his side. That's why he did it. 
The next most powerful organisation locally was the City of London. A few years earlier, they'd asked if they could have their own charter. He'd said, only if you pay me a huge amount of money. They hadn't got it, or at least they didn't think it was worth the money. I don't know which. But now, in May 1215, he issues a charter to the city for nothing. You can have your own Lord Mayor. That's what they wanted. In other words, it was appeasing. Appeasing the city, appeasing the church, and like appeasement in our modern world, appeasement in the 12th and 13th centuries did no good at all. The city gates were opened to the rebel barons. Early May. Those of you who are in London at the Lord Mayor's show next November and every succeeding November can have a, just an echo of it. The Lord Mayor's parade is the Lord Mayor going to see the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales to present his credentials, to swear his oath of loyalty to the Queen, and that is a direct result of and part of the charter that City got in 1215. So a month later, well, six weeks later, the parties met at Runnymede, armed on both sides. The barons had their conditions. They're called the Articles of the Barons. We've got them. There's nothing in the Articles of the Barons that says anything about the church, but the church looked after itself, and the first clause of the new Magna Carta, the new charter, simply reproduced the charters that had already been given uh, earlier that year. A couple of features to be noticed. The church somehow managed to get in first. That was, I'm not being cynical about it, that was not exactly novel in the medieval world. But the second is this, that in the charter, those clauses for the church are said expressly to be granted by our own free and spontaneous will. Any lawyer looking at the charter will say that's an interesting inclusion because it does not appear in any of the other terms and conditions offered to the barons. In other words, the king's the people on the king's side were saying, OK, OK, concede that this is free to the church, because it is, but leave it out for the barons. And so this should bring home to us, shouldn't it? This was a tough negotiation. That's what they were doing. They weren't making history. They were having a deal thrashed out. And can you imagine it? I mean, imagine yourself, stick on a sword, a bit of armour, wandering up and down, talking to me. Oh, I don't know the king will agree with that. Well, I wonder what... Um, I wonder what the Chief Justice will do about this. Whose side will she be on? Oh, I don't know about that. I'm a bit worried about this. You know, I've got two children growing up. I don't want them to have to go and fight. Well, I'm sorry, you know, but you've got to imagine it. It's a tough negotiation. And every lawyer here has been party to a negotiated settlement, and sometimes they're not easy. So John's in a hopeless position. His opponents have the largest forces. London up the road supports them, has opened the gates. His own supporters among the nobility were simply being true to their own obligations. None of them, none of them admired him. There was no personal loyalty. And what do the barons do? The barons have already threatened to offer the throne of England to Prince Louis of France. There's another turn the other way around, isn't it? So he's no cards to play and he puts his seal on the charter. That's it. Let me identify some crucial clauses. There's first our well-known justice provisions, justice not to be delayed or denied or sold. Consequence of this provision still with us is that you are entitled to justice. It wasn't grace and favor. You were entitled. You couldn't be locked up on the whim of the king or for that matter, as we shall see, the baron. And before long, again, as I've said, you were entitled to due process and before long, the great writ of habeas corpus, which we still have, still matters to us in England. Habeas corpus still applies. Somebody's locked up without cause being described. He is entitled to have lawyers go straight to the nearest judge for habeas corpus. What is more, in the justice provisions, it was provided that the punishment should fit the crime. A first step to sentencing guidelines and the like, and that those responsible for the enforcement of judgments, i.e. sheriffs, coroners and bailiffs, were not to be in office as judges. Very embryonic separation of powers. After all, if you're going to get justice, it also followed that you had to have a knowledgeable judiciary and eventually 
an impartial one. No scootage or tallage, that's any form of taxation, without the consent of the Council of the Realm and the clause providing how the Council was to be summoned. If you could, as the King, live off your own estates, that's fine. But if you want anything extra, you can't take it without consent. I hope I will be excused for Rudig saying something rude, but that was the Baron's equivalent of two fingers to the Pope telling them they had to pay the taxes whether they consented or not. And more important, during the regency uh, for the boy King Henry, this principle was applied and people became used to it. Third paragraph that matters, Clause 61, the King's agreement that he was required to rectify any failures to abide by the new agreement and that if he did not, this is really important in medieval times, his subjects, the barons in particular, were absolved from their obligations of fealty and obedience. In other words, the subjects of the king did not owe him absolute, unconditional fealty. The right of resistance to him was expressly authorised, an authorisation which extended to the, I'm quoting, whole community of the land. This was an extraordinary clause, and on the continent John was derided for agreeing to what was to abide by those who were described as over-kings. And we have very recently, Professor David Carpenter at King's College London discovered a contemporary poem from 1215 written in the charters of the Melrose Abbey in Scotland, doesn't use travel, reading in this way. England has ratified a perverse order. Who has heard of such an astonishing event? For the body aspired to be on top of the head. The people sought to rule the king. Clause 61 is the rule of law in gestation. There's a fourth crucial provision, which in the past talking about it, I have not really sufficiently emphasized. It addresses the idea that this was only about the barons. That's wrong. Clause 60 requires that everyone, whether cleric or civilian, to ensure that they extend the rights granted to them by the Charter, extend to their men. That is to say, their vassals, their villains. Someone, somewhere, probably in view of his political thought, Archbishop Langton, possibly William Marshall, had a vision which was years ahead of it, its time. And probably at Runnymede, think about it, they were probably rather tired, they'd got all these clauses written out, they'd got the one that mattered to them, Clause 61, we are absolved from our obligations if you don't abide by it. And they, you can just see Clause 60 being popped in. So they, what's that? Oh, just, uh, no, don't worry too much about that. Oh, boy, you've got uh, Clause 61 there. Too. <laughs> but there it is. Now, taken on their own and more importantly together, these were critical provisions in the medieval document, but there was more. Chapter 45 I love rem reminding myself of, of Judges are required to know the law. <laughs> Can I say that again? Judges are required to know the law. Yes, wonderful. But so should the enforcement officials, and they should not be appointed unless they would observe the law well. Punishment must fit the crime, the magnitude of the offence, the fine must not deprive a man of the ability to earn his living. Like trial before an impartial judge, excessive punishment after the fairest of trials is not justice. It isn't today. It wasn't then. Common pleas that civil cases were to be heard in the king's court in fixed or specified places. In other words, you should know where to go for your remedies. And more important, perhaps, it provided a very significant step away from what had been private courts, the hundred court, the manorial court, and that was run by your feudal lord. And if he was your judge, well, then he, you know, he was a bit indebted to the chap on the other side or needed a favour done from him, well, it might just mean a bit difficult to get impartial judgment. Now, this is not a compendious list. I'm not going to read the charter out to you. But for a peace treaty in a civil war, for a document which so the naysayers argue was of no real value to anybody very much except the barons, 
The justice provisions and the others taken together suggest this was not a bad start. And so the scribes wrote out copies of the charter, and then the king and the rebel barons and the royal barons and the archbishops and the bishops and the Lord Mayor of London all gathered together, and they swore an oath that they would keep the terms of the charter in good faith and without evil intent. Can you imagine it? Just at that moment, as I think the oaths were being taken, a number of immortal souls were in great, great peril. They were in a state of mortal sin because the oath was an oath to God. It was perjury. John had not the slightest intention of abiding by the charter forced out of him. And as a lawyer, I think the charter was unenforceable as a contract, sealed as it was under compulsion or duress. But to coin a modern phrase, peace in our time was secured, but for a very short time, shorter even than the infamous Munich Agreement, which some of our fathers fought and died about. As soon as the Pope heard about this, John immediately sent it off to the Pope. He annulled it, and he did not use language which left any doubt as to what he meant. The bull described John's wickedness, the surrender of the crowns of England, how the Pope was his feudal lord, and then having rubbed John's nose in it, he turned to everybody else. He was, after all, above all men. I'm using just some of the language, just for the sake of it. We utterly reprobate and condemn any agreement of this kind, forbidding under ban of our anathema the foresaid king to presume to observe it. Void. The charter and the obligations and safeguards in it were entirely abolished. They should have, quoting again, no validity at any time whatsoever. And so, ladies and gentlemen, from the Pope's point of view, you should all now leave the room. You should be ashamed of yourself for even listening to this lecture. <laughs> Magna Carta had gone. The originator of all our liberties was not worth the vellum it was written on. Never have bet, as I said a few minutes ago, anything on its future. And worse was to come, because civil war did break out in earnest. So did a French invasion, which everybody seems to have forgotten. It's simply not true that the last invasion of England was the Norman conquest in 1066. It's just not true. But that's what we've been taught since we're tiddlers, and that's what everybody believes. At the invitation of the rebel barons, across the channel came Prince Louis of France, later to be Louis, King Louis of France, he personally arrived in May 1216. The Lord Mayor and the city opened their gates to him and rendered homage to him. And he was never required to abide by the terms of the Charter. What mattered now was victory in the war. In military terms, there were 7,000 French troops, a vast army by the standards of the day, and of course, the rebel barons. We were in danger of a Capetan king replacing the Plantagenets. It's reasonable to assume that that would have been the end of the common law, crushed out of existence before it had begun. And however it might have developed, the English language that we all speak would not have developed as it has. Then two deaths occurred. Well. It's a privilege for me to be able to say this as a historian. It's a very fortunate thing. I don't feel any sense of grief about saying it. First Innocent, then John in October 1215. It was wonderful for the future of Magna Carta, but again, pause. What was it like living in England in October 1216 with a civil war and the heir to the kingdom, a boy aged nine? Probably no higher than this, indeed probably rather shorter. To contemporaries, it was a catastrophe. Boy kings had no future. He didn't have any uncles who were legitimate, who could act on his behalf till he got his majority. Uh, even with uncles, boy kings were murdered. The princes in the tower were murdered by somebody, whatever the romantics might think. Somebody murdered them. And John himself had, after all, disposed of his own nephew, Arthur. There's no doubt he was complicit in the murder of his nephew, a boy with a better claim to the throne on primogenitor grounds than John himself. And that's why he was got rid of, quite by accident, the way things do. People fall out of castles, you know? 
and they fall out blind and castrated. <laughs> All by accident. So we have it. The charter annulled by the spiritual head of Christendom and the feudal lord of England. French soldiers and armed men loyal to Louis' cause in a strong military position. The king is a little boy of nine. Now ask the question, rhetorically, luck or judgment, destiny or accident? It survived. It survived. It's an amazing story. The loyal barons, led by William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, a man who had come out from very humble circumstances to be the most senior nobleman in England, all entirely on merit, arranged for the boy's coronation immediately. But not at Westminster Abbey, because that was in the hands of the French troops. So he took the boy to Gloucester, Gloucester Abbey. Henry III, he was crowned. Within 10 days of John's death, Marshall, who though approaching 70, was a man of real action, had been elected as regent, elected. At Runnymede, he'd been the main non-clerical negotiator for John. His great quality was that he was trusted by everybody, rebels or not. Everybody knew that Marshall stood by his word and that he would serve this boy king with utter loyalty. Apart from those qualities, the situation was novel. And I've tried to think of a situation in medieval Europe where the crown is in the hands of a child and an outsider, not his mum or his uncle, an outsider is elected regent. And mark this too, of course, if you're elected, you can be de-elected. That's how democratic processes work to this day. So this regency represented, as it had to, a serious first attempt at conciliar government. And Marshall, with the papal legate, immediately reissued a new, different charter. Magna Carta, November 1215, and he banged his own seal onto it. Now, it's perfectly obvious, and my assessment is, that's nice, it means I'm agreeing with myself, that's a wonderful thing for a judge to do. <laughs> so, I'm not going to say the words, it's obvious, I'll just leave you with my own immediate assessment, is that it was his effort to persuade the rebel barons back to the negotiating table. Look, here I am, I've sealed your charge, I've sealed a charter for you. Indeed, if you look at the 1216 Charter, but I don't encourage you to, but if you do, you'll see basically it says, for heaven's sake, let's sort this out together before this civil war gets worse. But given the military strength of the opposition, and if you think you're winning, you don't particularly necessarily want to go to the negotiating table, the reissue did not bring peace. There's one little subtext, though, which is quite interesting. Marshall issued the Charter and he issued it in Dublin as well, on the basis that those in Ireland had the same rights as those who lived in England. Well, it didn't work out so well for the Irish, did it? But it's a very interesting state of affairs because it enabled Edmund Burke to argue when the American colonists were in rebellion that, apart from the fact they were right, they were entitled to rely on Magna Carta. Magna Carta had crossed the seas, wasn't stuck in England. Its blessings, therefore, weren't confined to England. Then comes 1217. Marshall himself led forces into battle at Lincoln. I mean, literally, led. Nearly 70, he was the greatest warrior of his generation. He was in such a hurry to lead the charge because the strategic opportunity opened on the top of the hill at Lincoln. Those of you who ever go there, go and look at the hill. It's quite a hill. He forgot to put on his helmet. I love this moment as I recollect what it must have been like for his squire. I'm a little squire. He's the greatest nobleman in England. He rules the country. And it's my job to say to him, terribly sorry, sir, you've forgotten your helmet. <laughs> well, he had. His squire gave him his helmet, he stuck it on. After the battle, it was very heavily dented, but he survived and inflicted a very heavy defeat on the French 
and the rebel barons capturing 46 of them. The French invasion floundered. There was a sea battle off the shores of England at the bottom end and the French reinforcements were beaten off and peace was achieved. So Marshall, Marshall again reissued the charter in different terms, but this time more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, not under compulsion as John was at Runnymede, not from a position of weakness as he did when he issued in 1216, but now in a position of strength based on victory in battle. It's very different to the barons, wasn't it? And he issued it and showed huge magnanimity in victory, a quality that Winston Churchill, hundreds of years later, was to identify, magnanimity in victory. And he paid Louis to leave the country and give up his claim to the throne, and he welcomed back into the family of the country all the rebel barons. It was a remarkable achievement. He's one of the great histories of our history in England, and I think, if I may say so, actually of yours. In three short years, from 1216 until his death, if he had not stood by the boy king and accepted the responsibilities of the regency and reissued and again reissued the charter, and by success in battle driving out the invading French, ruling by consensus, and bringing a peaceful end to civil war, our history, and all the countries where the common law has taken root would have been very different. And yet, he is virtually forgotten. At the time, he was given the equivalent of a state funeral where the archbishop described him as the greatest knight that ever lived. Henry III came first to partial majority and then to full majority. He needed money. He thought about adventuring in France, turned to the device employed by John, a tax on movables, personal property, and rents. At a council in Christmas 1214, a 15th of all your valuables, the value of your, all your valuables, was sought for the king. The great council insisted. Before it would be given, the king must himself reissue the charter. And in 1225, advised by Archbishop Langton, he did so. There's some important features to notice. This charter was granted freely of the king's spontaneous goodwill, it says, says so in the charter, to a whole class of the nobility and all our realm. The significance is that in the liberties and concessions granted by John, as I said, only the ones related to the church were said to have been given voluntary. You can see the hand of Archbishop Langton in this. He was one of these great thinkers who always believed that there should be limitations on royal power. You can see it in all his writings in the very, very early uh, part of the century. So, the charter couldn't be void for du duress. It was now a trading deal. You have your charter, I'll have my tax, or the other way around. I want my tax, you can have it, provided you abide by the charter. This pattern developed throughout his reign. There were occasions when the council refused the king financial support, no less than three times in the 1240s. They didn't think much of battling away in France at that particular stage. To lagio non cocidendo. For those of you without the Latin, and every judge in this room should have Latin, if you remember Peter Cook, because it's the Latin that you need, but for those of you who aren't judges, we do not concede taxation. By now, the word parliamentum is being used to describe assemblies of the council. By this time, I'm talking about Edward I's time, the knights and burgesses, that is to say, commoners, are now in parliament. There's a poetic justice here. Simon de Montfort, vision of what a parliament should be, produced another civil war. The poetic justice is that Henry III had never ceased to criticize William Marshall from the day he came to power himself to his majority for having been too generous to the defeated French and rebel barons. He never understood the value of a peace settlement, particularly of a civil war, that precious peace dividend. He never understood it. And here he was facing a civil war himself. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the basis of our medieval constitutional arrangements, the link between tax and consent, 
which eventually provided the basis for the 17th century struggle. I'll jump ahead, but the tax question is very significant to us all. It's the tax provisions and their implementation that meant that we ended up with a parliamentary system of government, not democracy, but a parliamentary system of government, whereas the Estates General in France and the Cortes in Spain and all the other representative institutes, institutions of the large European countries just disappeared under absolute monarchies. So, we mustn't sneer. This charter, or these charters, mattered, and we know it did. People started using them in law courts from 1220 onwards. We have the records, we know what is said. Baron from Northumberland in 1220 defended his right to maintain his castle and wanted a judgment, I quote, in the court of the Lord King by the judgment of my peers. 1226, there's a huge battle in Lincolnshire. Knights, not barons, rely on the security clause. The argument is based on, I quote again, contrary to the liberty that they ought to have by the charter of the Lord King. No printing press, no iPad, no email, no newspaper, no television, no nothing, but they knew about it. And there's a very important one by 1234, the Great Council actually deciding a case against the king against the medieval king because he dispossessed a man called Gilbert Bassett without, I quote, lawful judgment of his peers and by the law of the land. Direct lift. The king must return the land. And at this time, in the treaty is attributed to a judge, Henry Bracton, we find this statement, the king is under God and under the law because the law makes the king these are the very words Edward Cook was later to use King James I when he tried to give the new king a lesson in English constitutional history. And he was chucked out of his office and ended up in the tower. Um, it's suggested that Magna Carta went to sleep, and to some extent it did. But I just want to point how what we think as a community continues to matter. And we don't even know why. Richard II, not one of our greatest kings, but he, anyway, he lost the throne. But to make it all lawful, he was, well, Parliament decided to depose him. And the articles of saying what a bad king he was include his refusal to do justice according to law, his assertion that the laws were in his mouth or sometimes in his breast, and he alone could alter and create the laws of the realm. And almost obviously related to Magna Carta, the king had willfully contravened the statute of his realm, which provided that, I'm quoting again, no free man shall be arrested, etc., or in any way destroyed, nor should the king proceed or order any process against him. That's Parliament charging the king with breach of Magna Carta as a ground for his deposal, deposition. Parliamentary sovereignty, of course, is miles away, but it's becoming increasingly central in our constitutional arrangements. And although the Tudors managed the institution, and if I could give you a lecture about my views about Henry VIII, you'd be here forever, and I won't, but the early Stuarts simply didn't understand it. They were foreign kings. As a matter of fact, I was trying to think the other day how many kings of England have actually been English. We've had Normans, we've had Plantagenets who came from France, we've had Scots, we've had Welsh, the Tudors, Hanoverians, German, quite interesting thought, really. Anyway, the plain fact was that when James I succeeded to the throne, he had a deep conviction, there's no doubt about it, genuine, that regal authority was bestowed by God on the monarch and that it was to God that the king was answerable. We hey, what's that? It's the medieval coronation oath. You have to endure the injustices, unfairnesses of the king, even if he behaved like Nero, because he had to answer to God. Well, I've already mentioned this. If he answered to God, he wasn't much use to you here on earth. And that was when Chief Justice Cook quoted Bracton to the king. I've just given you the quotation. The king's response was that it is treason to affirm that the king was under the law. Treason, you got pretty nasty death if you were guilty of treason, and you didn't need much evidence. It was enough for the king to say so. 
nearly. There was always a trial, but somehow or other, the jury always convicted. Except once. There was a time, one time when they didn't. Cook's dismissed, goes to the Tower, goes into Parliament. The Commons. He had a forensic technique that made a blunderbuss seem like a very delicate instrument. <laughs> but he led the advance of what parliamentarians regarded as the rights given to or by or under the banner of Magna Carta. He had many supporters, the Selden Society lunch today, I've referred to one, John Selden himself. It wasn't a one-man show, but again, time doesn't permit me to go through all that. But Cook, for example, challenged, challenged the use of the word sovereign in relation to royal power. It was, he said, no parliamentary word. Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign. On another occasion, he said, if my sovereign will not allow me my inheritance, inheritance used in the form of the word birthright, I must fly to Magna Carta. When the king says he cannot allow, I say that again, when the king says he cannot allow our liberties of right, that strikes at the root. We serve here for thousands and tens of thousands. It wasn't democracy, of course, it wasn't a universal franchise. But Magna Carta was the banner, the, if you like, the trumpet call for the privileges of Parliament and its authority. And notice the importance of liberties of right. Unless it's a right we all have, it's no good. If it depends on the ruler, whether he's king, dictator, whatever, who says, you can have it, you can have it, you can have it, because I like you and you're on my side, you supported me at the last election, or you've been kind to my daughter or my son or whatever, but you can't and you can't and you can't because you spoke against me. It's not a liberty for anybody. Because those who get it first time round can simply have it withdrawn when the mood of the king dictator shifts. Now, we all know how the battle between Parliament and the King ended. The finest moment of Charles's life came in the last few hours before it ended on the scaffold, and we have to respect him for that. And those who judged him and condemned him to death, those who were still alive when his son was restored to the throne, suffered the most agonizing of deaths as traitors being hanged and drawn and then quartered. By the end of the century, his son, James, had abdicated. We had new rulers. They were chosen by Parliament. Our constitution was in irrevocably based on the sovereignty of Parliament. So the ideas for which Magna Carta had been the inspiration had triumphed here. Just worth bearing in mind that nobody knows why James II ran away. He had perfectly good forces. He could have fought for his crown. But he ran. And he'd been a brave man and a brave sailor in earlier battles. And what I'm trying to get across is this is nothing, history is not to do with destiny. History is to do with the workings of the mind and personality of the individuals who are living at the time. We then write books about it. And in the meantime, on the eastern seaboard of the future United States of America, colonization was happening. Just imagine this. It's a small population, something like 350,000 men and women left England for the colonies in the United States in the, between 1616 and 1700. And all of them treated Magna Carta as the foundation for their constitutional ideas. It's not an accident that the Virginia Charter, the first charter in eastern United States to Virginia, created by Edwin Sands of the Middle Temple, was called the Great Charter. The colonists had the same rights as if they had been born in England. As I say, a fundamental principle of British Empire. The assembly in Maryland legislated that all the inhabitants should have their rights and liberties according to the Great Charter of England. In Massachusetts, a body of law in resemblance to a Magna Carta was framed. And in 1680, an indication of trouble lying ahead, there was resistance to taxation by New York, which had only just become a British colony. It had been the Netherlands colony. Uh, against taxation being contrary to Magna Carta and the Petition of Right. That complaint did not realize that it was looking forward. It thought it was looking backwards. And then our sovereign parliament exercised its authority over the colonies in one of the most foolish statutes ever enacted in any representative assembly, the Stamp Act of 1765 and the Declaratory Act of the next year. And between them, those two acts sought to deprive the colonists 
of their right to trial by jury for breaches of the Stamp Act, in effect saying, you're mere colonials, you'll have to do what we tell you, whether you're represented or not, indeed without being represented in Parliament. And so the citizens of the future United States went into rebellion, relying on Magna Carta as embodying the principles of their birthright as Englishmen. And so to another war, although my American friends don't like me saying it, what in truth was another civil war? Benjamin Franklin on one side, his son on the other, and his son, the grandson, back on grandpa's side. They never spoke to each other again, except on one single occasion, to discuss a bill. And it was to the successful rebellion in the United States that young Thomas Wentworth, either born on a convict ship or born shortly afterwards, certainly one of the youngest babies to land in Australia, or one of the first convict babies to be born here, turned after education at Cambridge in the Middle Temple to where he found inspiration to achieve for all Australians, whether they came from convict stock or not, their children the liberties achieved in the United States. Of course, it wasn't democracy. This is the, we're still in the middle, early part of the 19th century. And in the United States, they didn't resolve the slavery issue. The slavery issue didn't resolve itself until a terrible civil war in which more young men, the flower of young manhood of the then United States of America, 600,000 of them were killed, more than their total casualties in both the First and the Second World Wars. I said earlier, civil war is terrible. So we have parliamentary sovereignty established in England, on Britain on the basis of Magna Carta, but parliamentary sovereignty that produced absurd legislation. <laughs> nice, nice to think we never produced absurd legislation now, but that's a reflection I'm not allowed to have, so please expunge the record. But if it was being said they were entitled to be ruled without being represented, the colonists relied on their Magna Carta rights. So they rejected parliamentary sovereignty. They evoked John Locke and natural law. They turned to rights which in their language had not been created by parchments and seals, but by rights founded on immutable maxims of reason and justice. I happen to agree with them, but you know everybody thinks that their side is immutable maxim of reason and justice. We all do, it's a funny thing about human beings. I like to go public and say, I really believe this, it's, not, it's unreasonable, it's unjust, and I still believe it. So they produced their constitutional arrangement which limited Magna Carta, and simultaneously asserted the rights developed from it. The Constitution itself was supreme and virtually immutable. And so we had this strange paradox that two great democracies, both of which at different stages in history can fairly be said to have been the leading nations of the world, relied on Magna Carta as the foundation stones for completely different constitutional arrangements. The short answer to this paradox, ladies and gentlemen, is that yet is simply all constitutions are creatures of their time. Your constitution here, here in Australia, here in Queensland itself, is a reflection of its time. In just the same way as Magna Carta itself, way back in that decade between 1215 and 1225, was itself and by its very terms a product of its times. None of the great events in that decade emerged from a cloud of vaporless gas. For me, they've never dissipated into the earth. Nevertheless, even with 800 years of history behind it, I venture to suggest to you that this very condensed account of Magna Carta and its creation demonstrate the dangers of studying history without remembering that what is history to us was simply the future to those who were involved in the events at the time. And by definition, as Shakespeare's, I think, most important line of all, I can do you friends, Roman countrymen, to be or not to be, etc., etc. But his most important line for all of us is, what's to come is still unsure. Our histories would have been very different if John had lived, or Innocent had lived, or Marshall had not lived, in very old age by medieval standards, and still had the energy to take on the burdens of regent for a boy king, or indeed if somebody else had been elected before him, Ranulph Blunderbill, Earl of Chester, 
was one of the people they were thinking of, and Ranulf said no, he didn't want it. If he'd wanted it, he might well have been made regent, and he wasn't the man that Marshall was. So history is not made by the events that we look back on, but by the particular people at the particular time and their responses to them. I have one last word. We have every reason, I think, to be proud of Magna Carta. For me, personally, it remains a living document. I believe it is a living document. It's the banner. It's the symbol of our liberties. Just because it's 800 years old, we can assume, and I suspect we've all noticed occasions when we have adopted a slightly arrogant attitude to what I shall describe as the newer democracies, seeking to establish democracies, seeking to establish it and fix it, having trouble being overtaken by authoritarianism or militarism or a dictator suddenly emerging. Where we're sometimes arrogant, can we be a little humble? Where we might be a little patronizing, can we all try and remember that the democracy which is now established in your country and in ours took hundreds of years to establish and involved the shedding of much blood? And perhaps most important of all, that even now here in Australia, as here in England, perhaps I should limit it to here in England, but I don't think you'd want me to, we should be careful never to assume in the words in the charter itself that the liberties and right and justice and consent can be taken for granted. There's a very clear warning for the first publication of Magna Carta in the United States in 1687 by William Penn. William Penn, the man who was on trial at the Old Bailey and the jury refused to convict him and the judge locked them up and ordered them to convict him and the jury refused to convict him. The great moment when trial by jury meant that the jury's verdict was sacred and nobody else could tell them what to find, something that matters to all us, all of us. It is easier to part with or give away great privileges, but hard to be gained if once lost. What William Penn called privileges, we now call rights. I don't think it matters what we call them, as long as we have them. But there are still many countries in the world where what we do call our rights remain privileges needing to be won and then entrenched. So those of us who are blessed with them must guard them. I think it's accident. I don't think Magna Carta was destiny any more than it was destiny for Hungary or the Holy Roman Empire or the King of Aragon. If it is to survive, it is to re remain what uh, Gerald called it, an incantation of the spirit of liberty, it's not a question of luck. It's up to us. We have to make sure. Thank you. It's pretty obvious that my job is unnecessary, which is to thank our speaker today. Um, we have been treated to a, a lesson in medieval history, um, but unlike some lessons in medie medieval history, it has been a treat delivered with uh, eloquence and entertainment in equal measure. I don't presume to comment upon the paper at all, but from my perspective, it really was wonderful, educational and entertaining, and I'm sure that's true from the perspective of everybody uh, here today. Um, as part of uh, expressing our thanks, it's my pleasure to uh, give Lord Judge a small gift as a token of our esteem. It is very small, and it's the second time today that I've done this, so I hope it doesn't overload the luggage. <clears throat> uh, but just in order to reprise our thanks, may I ask you once more to thank Lord Judge for his wonderful <laughs> lecture.
One, one question which wasn't answered was whether or not Lord Judge survived the bowling of um, that famous Western Australian bowler. If you wish to know the answer to that question, you may have the opportunity of asking Lord Judge yourself. Uh, you are all invited to uh, a convivial occasion of drinks uh, in the portrait gallery outside the Banco Court. Um, and I'm sure, and I know, that Lord Judge will be very happy to tell you the tale. Thank you very, thank you very much.